So I've been asked to start this evening by just saying a little bit about who I am and why I'm supporting the demands of Women's Place UK. My name's Helen Mary Jones, some of you know me. Um, I ha well, have been in past lives the Deputy Director of the Equal Opportunities Commission in Wales. For 12 years I was a member of the National Assembly and spent a lot of that time serving on the Equality Committee. I think I can safely say that like many of you here I've given a lifetime towards campaigning for equality and social justice, not only for women's rights but for the rights of other traditionally excluded groups. And for me that has always included trans people. In a previous role I worked for a national youth work organisation and we established a national network for trans young people because they had come to us saying that they didn't feel included in those youth work provisions that were supposed to be LGBT and they felt that the T wasn't included. I worked with my colleagues with those young people over a period of several years and that included uh, creating opportunities for them to talk directly to Welsh ministers about their concerns, about their access to services. Anybody who tries to tell you that Women's Place UK is a transphobic movement, I can tell you now that I would not be in that, this room if that was the case, and I'm sure that's true of every single one of us here. But that doesn't mean to say that over time I haven't experienced disquiet. I became concerned in my previous role about the numbers of young, non-gender conforming women, the girls that we would have called when I was young, tomboys, who were feeling so uncomfortable with themselves that they felt that the only way to achieve that comfort, they couldn't be happy to be gender non-conforming girls, the only way that they could achieve that comfort with themselves was to transition to the opposite sex. And I began to wonder how much of that was just that, you know, when people can talk more openly about these issues, people can be themselves, and just as we've seen with lesbian and gay people, they can come out and they can be themselves. How much of this rise, particularly in girls identifying as trans, was to do with that, it being easier for them to do it, and how much of it was to do with how incredibly difficult it is to be a teenage girl in our pornified, hideous culture where everything is photographed every five seconds, where if you don't get this number of likes on Instagram, where you are nothing, where you can't get away from the bullies at school because they'll find you at home on social media. I started to ask myself some questions. It wasn't my place to ask then those questions of those young people. But I think that those are some questions that we need to think about. We need to live in a world, I think, where we don't expect little girls to be this and little boys to be that. Children, young people, all of us ought to be allowed to be ourselves. And what brought me to speaking out about these issues was, was a couple of things. One being, I was finding how difficult it was for some other women in other professional situations to do that women working in fields like education and social services being told that they weren't allowed to ask questions about these issues. Now, I don't say that I've got the answers. I absolutely know I haven't. But I was really worried about those questions not being able to be asked. I'm privileged now. I'm an associate professor at Swansea University. What I say publicly is protected by academic freedom. And knowing that there were other women who couldn't ask these questions, but that I could, I felt there was a responsibility that I should. And then there's the very specific legal issue for me of automatic self-identification. Now I believe, and other women in this room may disagree with me, other people in this room may disagree with me, I believe that the current process for, for, for trans people changing their sex is onerous, it is difficult, and I think it's, it needs reform. But I think the proposal that one can simply go into a solicitor's office and sign a piece of paper to say that your biological sex has changed is difficult and dangerous. I think the process by which the Women and Equalities Committee arrived at that process is profoundly flawed. And I was yes, last week in Parliament talking to some senior parliamentarians about how that process was done. And no evidence was taken from women's groups. There was ample evidence, and quite rightly, taken from groups representing trans people, or groups that say that they represent trans people. But there was no direct evidence taken from women. Written, ev written evidence was submitted. But as one of the parliamentarians said the, to me, the truth is, 
It's the, uh, it's the oral evidence, it's the people you see that stick in your head. She said, I get this amount of paper to read for every committee meeting. If I'm honest with you, I don't read it in as much depth as perhaps I should because I literally can't. But if somebody's sitting in front of me talking about their experiences, then that really sticks with you. So the proposal from that committee at Westminster is based on limited evidence and we have to be able to have a dialogue that enables us to find, as a community, a way forward that supports the rights of trans people and that supports the rights of women. I'm a bit naive, and I actually thought that we might find it a bit easier to do that here in Wales. <laughs> you know, people know each other. It's relatively easy to get to talk to your Member of Parliament, to get to talk to your Assembly member. I don't think that now. After today, and I feel sad. Uh, I feel sad at some of the things that I've been called. I feel sad that the organisation that I spent seven years of my life working for, an organisation that I transformed in terms of its uh, finances, its staffing, everything, has publicly dissociated themselves from me for wanting to have a debate. But I also feel lucky and I feel proud because in stepping into these difficult waters, I have met some of the most amazing and interesting people, men and women, but particularly women, that I've met in my life. And we're going to hear from three of them today. So thank you all again so much for coming. I'm going to do all the actual thanks at the end. But just before I introduce our first speaker, oh, and by the way, I need to apologise for the introductions. The, the time that I was meant to spend this afternoon with the speakers writing proper introductions for them all for me to introduce them was spent handling phone calls from the newspapers and the radio and because of all this nonsense with the hotel. So I am going to ask our speakers when they begin to speak to briefly introduce themselves. But before I do that, can I just ask everyone to say a very big thank you to Cor Kokion Paddy for entertaining us. <laughs> Each of our speakers will speak for about 20 minutes on a different aspect of this agenda, raising different concerns, and then we'll throw the floor open for questions and discussion. So if I can ask Jenny, you're happy to start. <laughs> 